I came to the last three meetings with only one resolution, and that was not to say anything. But when Brother George asked me, I, I do, to be honest, I have to say, I still do have a little feeling in my inner being that the Lord might want to continue just a little bit from this afternoon. And I trust he would give us the grace and the utterance that this could be uttered in a spirit, even his spirit. But I can't help but have a feeling that one of the questions he's still asking is, is it right with you and your family? Is it right with you and your children? Is it right with you and your spouse? It's all wonderful to talk about being so right and so one with the Lord. But it really should reflect itself in our home and in our relationship. You know, I've noticed in the scripture that often some of the great leaders of God had a problem with their family. You've noticed that, of course. There was Samuel and different other ones. And I wonder whether this indicates that there is a problem when we put our work ahead of our family. You know, the other word the Lord has given me is that we need to set our children free, our spouse free. There's lots of spiritual abuse going on out there. There's lots of leadership that are tyrannizing and putting people in condemnation and frustration and confusion and trying to speak the Lord to them for the Lord. And they never grow up into Christ because people set themselves between the head and the people. And many of us have seen this, brothers and sisters. But recently the Lord has had to show me this is true in my life and in my home. We have four precious children. When the little one I mentioned this afternoon, when she was in her 20s, she said to me one day, she said, Dad, please now, if you will, please listen. And I hope you won't be upset, but I just have to say something. She said, you know, Dad, I know exactly 100% everything you think and believe. I've been in your home 25 years. Growing up there, I know all of it. But you know, it's getting very, very hard. I'm trying to hear the Lord and know the Lord, and I know He wants me to respect my parents and to honor them. And I know He wants me to, 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 uh, to do what they say. But it, it's so confusing. Because... I don't know if it's you or if it's the Lord or what it is. And I want to learn to know what the Lord's speaking. But I don't want to go against what you say. Dad, could you give me a little space? I know you love me and you're trying to protect me and you want me to be for them. You intended so well, Dad. But it's just please give me some space. And listen, Dad, I don't want to offend you. But I might have to take some of the things that you've held so precious and have given to me, I might have to take some of them and lay them away. And then if the Lord gives them to me, they'll be mine. Then I'll know they're mine. And I know he's dealing with me. Did you get everything from your parents, Dad? If I know your history, I know that it wasn't that way. 
Well, the Lord was very, very gracious. And he gave me a few buckets of tears. And I had much repentance to do to my daughter. That I had usurped the headship of Christ in her life. You know, there's a difference, friends. We must know between the letter and the spirit. We mentioned a little this afternoon, even in the home with our spouse, when we talk submission, we produce the opposite. Have you ever noticed? The letter will produce the very opposite that we're after. Talk oneness, push it, promote it, you end up creating division. Live in the spirit of oneness, and oneness begins to emerge. And it permeates from your heart to the hearts of others. But make it a doctrine. The same with the order in the home. I was looking, we were fellowshipping a little in the break, and I was looking for a verse, and I finally found it in Romans chapter 7. And I'm sure some of you know this verse, but I saw it in a new way. It says here, For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, Do not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. You know, sometimes we produce in others the very thing we're trying to save them from. Sometimes we produce rebellion by preaching against rebellion. Now, I'm not talking at this point with small children, but even there, God must give us much grace and wisdom. But I would like to say to you parents, when was the last time and how often have you apologized and even confessed to your children? Have you been able to be vulnerable? Oh, yes, we can confess to the Lord, but can we confess to them? I ask this of you for myself. And God has shone his light in my heart, and I'm sorry. I consecrated you to the Lord, not to myself. And especially if we serve the Lord, we're so desperate that our children would also serve the Lord. That in itself can put a pressure. Our zeal will bring others into condemnation. But you know what it is? It's partly the fact that we actually are living by the law ourselves. And we have disciplined ourselves through all the years, and we've come to a certain measure that we can more or less perform, automatically we expect it of everybody else, even when we don't know it. And we exude condemnation on anybody who doesn't pray as much as I do, or this and this and no. Because... We have not come to see that all of that counts absolutely nothing. God sees the depravity of our being in our heart. And the moment we allow him to show it to us and we repent and we confess and we find out his grace is still there. And it's because of his grace that he accepts me, not because of what I do. Then we stop expecting things of others. A dear sister came to me some time ago. We were visiting Fifteen years before, she was in a congregation where I served in the leadership. And she said, Albert, I have to tell you something. She said, all the while we were together in the church, I loved you and I admired you. But I was very much condemned by you. I just felt I'd never be able to measure up. I'd never be able to know the word the way I should. I'd never anything. And I knew how much you loved me, but I, I just couldn't help it. And I said, and what do you mean now? She said, it seems you're different. You don't seem to expect or require things from me anymore. But when I'm around you, my heart warms up toward the Lord. But I don't have to do anything. And I said, sister, I repent of all the law and all the condemnation that I put you under ever, and I want to set you free. 
You don't need to please me. You don't need to serve me. You don't need to do anything for me or anything I tell you. If your heart draws you, you better love Jesus. But even do that because he loves you. A whole new relationship emerged. Of course, I was blessed with a mama. I have to tell you this about her. Sisters, mothers. My mama wore a cap like those Amish people. She wore strings on it. She wore a certain kind of a plain dress. She loved Jesus with her whole heart. But there was something special about her conservatism, and that was she never, ever anticipated, implied it, or expected it of anyone else, including her daughters. One time when she was in a nursing home, she was having Alzheimer's, and I came to see her, and she was sitting on the bed. She had this prayer cap on every minute she was awake. This was her conviction in her heart. And she had her hand around the lady who was sitting there with a red sweater, her hair as short as mine, green slacks. You'd never seen my mother that way, even in her grave. And my mama had her arm around this lady and they were singing, Oh, how I love Jesus. And when I came in, she said, Albert, I'm so glad you came right now. I want you to meet one of my best friends. And we love our Jesus. A heart that knows no condemnation. Doesn't subscribe its own. God brings us into conviction, into discipline. Don't lay it on anybody else. Set him free. Can we set each other free? And we set our children free. Can you trust them to the Lord? But then we keep reaching over the shoulder. No, 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 not that way. Now, just go on with the Lord. Oh, but wait a minute. No, 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 not like that. Even we don't see it in our words. They feel it in our heart. Fellowship. After two or three years, last week, we were at his house enjoying our grandson, having a beautiful time together. I noticed a tape laying here on his kitchen cupboard, and it had his name on it. I said, what's this? He said, oh, they asked me to speak at the fellowship. I said, oh, do you mind if I listen to him? No, no. I put it in my tape deck, and I listened to it, and I began to weep. He's saying exactly what his daddy says. But he just needed his daddy to back away. And I tell you, he said it with conviction, not because daddy said it. Not because somebody programmed it into him. Anyway, especially those of us, or those, not I guess I can't say us, I have no responsibility anymore, anywhere. I've lost it all. I think in these days the Lord is getting very jealous about who's the head of every member. Oh yes, we do have a responsibility in leadership, but we've got to learn how to stop reaching over the shoulder and stop telling people what the Lord wants to. I was just touched. Another brother was sharing about with these Amish how some have come into them and trying to tell them they should do this or they should change that. And I could sense in this brother a godly jealousy. As much as to say, leave them alone. The Lord will lead them. Feed them Christ. It's the spirit of Christ Jesus that sets us free. Not more law. Tell them to stop dressing that way. You're just bringing them into another bondage. The Lord can unravel and work that out. If like my mama, they want to wear that till they die, bless their hearts. If they feel the Lord leads them that way. And if you do that for them, their heart will get wide and they'll love all the family. Let's stop trying to bring each other into conformity. 
Sometimes we mistake unity for conformity. We were in a place we had such amazing unity. You could sense, sell, smell, sense, and even see if a person wasn't in the oneness. But it became a conformity to the uttermost and a pressure. The Spirit is a conformity as a result of the Spirit's working. My mother in that, what we used to would have called worldly lady, were one in the Spirit, and the anointing was upon them. Well, I don't want to get carried away, but dear brothers and sisters, to have the Lord have, we want to say, Lord, have move. But we also have to get our hands out to, from the directing of it. Really trust. And listen, most of us, especially us older ones who have taken so long to go through some of these things, we've made a lot of mistakes and blunders. If we let our children make them quite soon, they might pass through much more quickly than we did. So trust each other to the Lord. And one other thing that came in the fellowship at the break was how our spirit and the spirit in which we say something has such a tremendous capacity to either transmit the love of Christ or to transmit some of our own zeal or even our frustration. The sister was singing and singing, purify my heart. One of the reasons we need our heart purified is because whatever is impure in it taints what we say. We may say the very same words, but the taste and the flavor to the recipient will be different. And the fruit of it will be different. We all know. You can say, honey, I love you. Or, honey, I love you. You know, because you've been told you don't ever express your love. Or, something transmitted from your spirit. Honey, I love you. Wow. That touches the spirit. And the response is love. And when I say to my honey, thank you, something is transmitted. When I say to my children, I'm sorry. I was brought up, I never heard that in my home. Never. I thought it would have been the, the greatest weakness on earth for a parent to say they're sorry, especially to weep tears. I didn't learn to weep tears until I was 30 years old. Never even knew a man could weep. I don't know if it's coming together. Someone would want to respond or carry it on or the Lord is completed. But humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Sometimes humbling is to say, I'm sorry. How much we expect our children to do things for us. And yet it was for their own good. But we were expecting something to build up ourselves. Parents are not to expect for their children. They're to provide for them. Oh, it's, it's, we really need the Lord's purging and cleansing. Even if our children honor and serve the Lord. To separate the pride we receive from it, from ourself, is not a small thing. We just need to keep asking the Lord again and again, shine in, purify my heart. You know, mothers are the ones who have a burden to pray for their children. Mothers, you need to pray much for your children. But I'd like to ask you, how do you pray for your children? I think many mothers spend a lot of time advising the Lord 
how he should handle their children. It's kind of like, I can't get this thing accomplished. Lord, this is what I'd like you to do. Do this, stop that, don't let them do this, show them this, show them that. The Lord convicted us, my wife and I, about how we pray for our children. And we have four, as I said, two very much loving and walking with the Lord. One, not so much. And the youngest one is quite stray, quite stray. I heard a little song on a tape, an African tape, and the singers had some verse of the line about a straying daughter. And it went like this. Give her just a glimpse of you. Show her that your love is true. Oh, Lord, reveal your love. Oh, Lord, reveal your love. Then a line went something like, she sits by the telephone thinking that she should call home, but she cannot find the words to say, reveal your love. Oh, Lord, reveal your love. Give her just a glimpse of you. I said to my wife, that's the safest prayer. Pray that God would reveal his love to your children. Oh, we prayed that our daughter wouldn't get into this and wouldn't get into that. And all the things we feared most, she got into. Recently, she made an announcement to us. I guess I should be honest and open. She had been married to a young Christian. He turned out to be worse than a tyrant. She didn't know him. She just came apart. She said she can't live her human life this way. And he really was quite unbelievable. She had a divorce. Now she's so afraid. She can't trust somebody. She has a very special friend, and recently she told us, Mom and Dad, I know you don't agree with this, and you don't believe this is right, but I'm going to move in with him. I got to get to know him. The Lord gave me the grace to wait for a few minutes before I replied. One of the first lessons I think he likes to teach parents. I said, honey, you already said you know how we feel, and we know you do. We just want to tell you, you're our daughter, and we love you, and we always will. Tears came to our eyes. We went on and we had our dinner. The Lord has given us the grace not to ever say one word more. We don't need to. We've turned it over to him. And we haven't even told him that he should stop this or do this or that. Only he knows in his sovereign design what we all must pass through. We like to spare everybody, especially parents who've gone through the depths of degradation. They are so desperate to try to spare their children from it. But they don't realize that God, in his sense, actually used that to bring them to where they are. He's greater than the enemy. He can use even the works that the enemy does. Certainly we need to pray a hedge about them. But again, when is the point of reaching over and becoming the clergyman to those dearest to us? We can see it there. Let's see it here. I don't know, but I just trust, I believe, the Lord would free, set, set the families free. And there's nothing more beautiful than a family in sweet harmony. And I don't know if this is proper to say, but even with this girl, daughter, our family is in sweet harmony. We can get together. If we get meet at our house, we have a prayer before we have a meal. I don't have to pray about that situation. I don't even have to have little implications. I can just worship and honor God and love Him and commit ourselves all to Him. You know, after we begin to see some of this, we wrap our comments up in some 
very vague spiritual probes, but our kids are so sensitive, they can tell right away, even if we wrap it 40 layers, that there's something inside there that's trying to... You know what I'm talking about? They feel it, and it creates an animosity, and we build a barrier. We believe with all our heart the Lord is going to restore all our children because they at one time gave themselves to the Lord. So we just say, Lord, that's between you and them. We keep reminding him of that, but how to work it out. So we're free. We don't need to worry anymore. We don't need to bear it on our shoulder. Maybe we did something wrong. Of course, we did many things wrong. But his grace is still cleansing and covering us. So do you understand what I mean when I say set the people free? You know, we become Pharaoh to people. He said, set my people free that they can worship me. And that's one thing I appreciate about this weekend. There's a, quite a freedom. I mean, I've never gone to a place where I know virtually nobody. I've only known George for a few years. That Such a liberty. I go all over the country. I go to 30, 40 different worship church places per year. This is a special, precious freedom. So the Lord does have a way. Please don't receive this word as condemnation. But I left the denomination and I left it telling them they're Babylon, they're this, and they're that, and they're all those other things. And we took a whole bunch of young people with them 25 years ago, created offense to the uttermost. All those people forever after were closed. Five years ago, after the Lord had worked in our heart, and we never set foot back in that Babylon place ever. Five years ago, when we were back in that community, Ontario, the Lord said, go back to that place. We thought it started at 10 o'clock, and we got there a little before 10, and it was already in session, everybody inside. But the Lord had said, go, so go. we went. We came to the door, and a man met at me at the door and said, oh, Albert. I had been pastor there six years. My goodness. I said, Anson, the last time I saw him, he was 40. Now he's 60. So he said, I have a seat for you. Everybody was standing second row to the back by the aisle. They told us to go in. He told us to go in there. No one in that whole place knew that we were there except those that usher. After the singing, they sat down, they had the bulletin and the order of service and all this. And Janet took the bullet and she looked at it. And toward the end, it said, open sharing. She showed it to me. And she said, honey, I'll be praying. <laughs> I said, oh God, <laughs> for me to get into this place, it's a dra dramatic miracle. You've broken me down to bring me in this place. Surely you wouldn't want me to say anything. Okay. Yet I had a feeling maybe the Lord would want. So I told the Lord, Lord, if I've got to speak something, you've got to give me verbatim what to say. I can't afford to offend your people for another 20 years. Oh, have mercy on me. And besides, I, I put an addendum on if nobody else shares during that time, I won't. So the meeting went on, the ritual, the whole thing. And I feel very much at peace. I felt at freedom to do with them whatever they were doing. Got to that time and I felt the Lord had given me verbatim. And he, the uh, moderator, whatever, got up and he said, now it's open sharing time. Stand where you are, come to the front, whatever. He went and he sat down, and nobody moved. After a bit, he got up, and as he got up, the Lord rebuked me and said, Do you decide whether to share because someone else did or didn't? I said, I'm sorry. I got up and I stood in the aisle. Now, this is a congregation where I pastored for six years, but had been gone 20 and I got up, and the Lord gave me these words. Dear, precious brothers and sisters,
that I am Albert and Janet there from Vancouver. <gasps> the people turned around toward the back. The, the older people went, <gasps> Who's this? <gasps> this is, oh. And then the next words that came were, we realized we wouldn't have the opportunity to greet you all one by one. We have many precious memories of this place. How you loved us. How you cared for us and provided us. And we're so happy that you have followed on as you've sensed the Lord has led you. And we're here to bless you. And I read a short verse and I sat down. Folks, it was like the Lord had his finger on the thermometer, on the thermostat. When I started, it was like about 50 degrees in there. And just in those minute and a half, the temperature went up to 80 degrees. You could feel the warmth coming in and the coldness leaving. And when I finished, it was like there was one person in that whole congregation After the congregation, the meeting was over, they lined up in the aisle. Some to hug and embrace us and ask us if I remember when I buried their mama. When I cried all night with the young family who lost their son in an accident. The husband who'd lost his wife. Please come to dinner. In the next two days, we were in three or four different homes and we ended up weeping in the Lord every place. I said, my, these people suddenly became open. <laughs> the Lord said, when you see something, many times you're the hindrance, not the one. It's the Spirit. It's where our heart is. And only the Lord. I was blessed by this sister singing. It's not whether we know it. It's whether it's gone through the fire in our being. for receiving you, brother. Thank you, Brother Albert. I really felt we we had a beautiful presence of the Spirit here this morning and God did a great work in families that were here. Some some of our good friends, the families that were here and there was a great work done in, the, in their hearts, I'm sure. But then, there's many families out there, and and God can do the same work out there as you embrace these beautiful principles and by the God, God's help begin to practice them. The same thing will happen out there. So don't think, well, I missed it then, this morning, or anything like that. I mean, God gave us a beautiful display of what He loves doing, what He wants to do. And now the message has gone to the parents. To how, how these things can happen, and I appreciate that. I had no real desire to call this camp. I, we used to have regular annual camps, not of this nature, well, not of this size really, but smaller family camps where I was working with other brethren and I felt that phase of it came to an end as far as I was personally concerned. But like I said, uh, encouraged by my Brother Gene there, and thinking upon it, praying about it, it seemed this was to be in God's will, and the word got around, and I prayed, God, we just want you to bring whom you would. And I put in the letter, I only sent out 80, 90 invitations, mostly in the Northwest here, because it seemed like a family camp for the Northwest of the States, and this part of Canada, I put in the letter. Just because I'm sending this letter doesn't mean I'm inviting you to come. Pray about it and do as the Lord will. 
And I believe God has done a beautiful work, and I prayed much the last two or three weeks that God would do something in His people that they would take home with them. An eternal work that they would take home with them. Because if the, if that doesn't happen, it's just a memory. Where you had a good time, lots of activity, lots of fun maybe. One man said, and I was told in a way, I'm just going by by what I was told. He doesn't used to go to church to hear the word of God and worship God, but now I go there to have fun. God help us to know that coming together with God's people, oh, a time of joy, yes. It's a solemn assembly, they were called in the scriptures. It doesn't mean solemn in the sense we think of it down in the mouth, but a time of seriousness, a time when you come together to hear God and know what he wants and hear his voice and know what he desires of us that we might be the child he wants us to be, the son, the daughter he wants us to be, the father, the mother he wants us to be, that God might fulfill that good word that he has. Somebody, oh, here it is. That good word that he declared for his people. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of that great and dreadful day of the Lord. And I know there's been probably a hundred or two hundred Elijahs in this last couple of decades. But we know it's the, that spirit of restoration, that spirit of, that rested on John the Baptist. First on Elisha and John the Baptist and then on his servants and I believe our generation on many of his servants that spirit of restoration that God wants to restore that which was taken away by the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm and the locust. He's going to restore it. God couldn't restore my family the way it was. And it doesn't mean that he's going to restore it the way you think he should restore it. Give courage, Leonard. Louis. Give courage. God knows how to restore in ways that not the way we thought he should. When it's all over, he said, Lord, I wanted you to restore it the way I had in mind. But God, this is far beyond anything I imagine. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest they come and smite the earth with a curse. Last verse of the Old Testament. Who says it? Just hand it to me. Somebody that's missing from your Bible. Who? Come and get it. Because <laughs> you need that. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that thou art the King of all kings and Lord of all lords that you're reigning on the throne of glory as the great high priest after the order of Melchizedek, that God the Father hath given to you all things and that all things are put under your feet, and that until we see that happen, you have this declaration from God Almighty, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies until I subdue them under your feet. And that the time is at hand when the King of glory is going to manifest His glorious presence in the earth and in His people, that the righteous judgments of God might go forth throughout the land, throughout the earth, first of all in His people in the church, not because He's going to torment them, but because He wants to cleanse them and purify them. Therefore, He is fulfilling this promise, the last promise of the Old Testament. He's going to send forth an Elijah ministration that's going to prepare the hearts of the people that there might be fathers turning their hearts toward their families, which will cause the families to turn their hearts 
toward them, that together they turn their hearts unto God, that once again the family of God in the earth will be the church of the living God. For is not the church of the living God composed of many families? And how shall the family of God, the corporate family of God, be glorious and without blemish and without spot if the families in that gathering are devastated, broken, full of bitterness, one toward another, and then come to church with their family to bring it into the church, and then glorying in a Laodicean church which is full of all these kinds of families, and saying we're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. But God sent forth this spirit of Elijah, which is the spirit of God resting upon your people to bring about this great restoration, Lord, which you have devised in your own heart. You're the family of God, like the family of Jacob and all their dissension and bitterness. Yet, because of a famine, we're brought to Joseph to receive the blessing after they had come to repentance. God has got that Joseph people getting them ready that in the day of famine which is beginning, maybe a famine of water and bread, but preeminently a famine of hearing the word of the Lord will find that they're bankrupt, that they're starving, that they have no food. God's preparing a Joseph people through trial and tribulation, through affliction, that he might come forth and bless the family of God and bring them together and remove the bitterness and bring about a great transformation in the worst of them. That even Judah, one of his persecutors, might bow before Joseph and say, Make me to be thy bond slave, but let my brother go free. God brings about this kind of love in the people of God. They're not going to be accusing their brother and blaming him because of his condition. See, I told you so and it's come upon you. But they love their Brother, so much that for their brother's sake, they're willing to say, Oh, Master, make me to be your bond slave forever, but let my brother go free. We ask for restoration, Lord, but are we recognizing, cause us to recognize in bringing about this restoration, there must come such love for you that we're willing to lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, whom we feel have been rejecting us and abusing us and turning in their hearts from God and expecting you to judge them. God put upon us that true spirit a substitution if I may call it that Lord let me suffer their pain let me suffer their trouble but oh God set that one free we'll see such a healing coming in the body of Christ such a oneness such a union in the spirit
that we can hardly imagine now when we love the brethren so much that we will, as John the Apostle said, be willing to lay down our lives for the brethren. God, I'm talking to you, but I find myself talking to your people at the same time. Oh God, I pray that you would come upon your people, Lord, in this closing meeting of this convocation. And even now, Lord, begin to write upon their hearts, Lord, the things that they have heard by the Spirit. There may have been idle words. There's bound to be idle words until we come to that perfection that you desire. No one intended to utter idle words. No one perhaps thought they were. We don't know you're the judge. But in spite of any idle words that were spoken, Lord, we know you spoke words to the hearts of your people by your Spirit, and we pray that you will seal those words in their hearts. The seal of the living God, seal it in their hearts. So they become a part of them, Lord. They might realize that the Bible that they've known and read, God put a, a a word in their hearts that they can say it is mine. For you have declared I will write my laws on their hearts and in their minds and they shall be my people and I will be their God. And you will not have to say one to another, Know the Lord for all shall know me from the least to the greatest of them. Oh God, that's far beyond what we've been talking about. When your people will know you so well, apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers will no longer be needed. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest of them. That's God's purpose. The purpose of these other ministries is that all the people of God should come to know him. In the fullness in the fullness of his presence. Not that they should be elevated as some great one in the church, but that in humility they would be able to so minister Christ that others would rise up in the stature of Christ and until the one who's been ministering him will see such a display of the glory of Christ that he will come to him and say, God has given you an aspect of the glory of Christ I know nothing about. I want to, I want to be around you. I want to hear from you. What we see from you. Lord, we've spoken of troublous times coming because you've declared it and you've whispered it to us and many others in the land. But Lord, that doesn't do us any good if we know what's going to happen and when. You only tell us these things that we might prepare our hearts by your word and spirit and by walking in obedience to you. For the day of the Lord which cometh, it cometh, saith the Lord. It is dark, it is grievous. People are not ready, they're not prepared for that because if in the time of peace there's all kinds of trouble and unrest and dissatisfaction and unthankfulness and grumbling against God and man and our brother. And yet we have plenty to eat and place to sleep. What will we do in the swelling of Jordan? Well, because this day, great day is coming, prepare for that great day, saith the Lord, prepare for that day. For it is day to those who are the children of the day and who walk in the light, but it is darkness to those who walk in rebellion. In rebellion against God. It's darkness to them. It's 
truly as the glory cloud that was a, a light to the children of Israel was darkness to the Egyptians. Stay in the light. Don't try to penetrate back into the darkness of Egypt to try to clean it up. Walk in the light. For God himself will deal with the darkness of this world as you and I walk in the light, which is walking in truth. And truth is love, and love is strong, and love is righteous, and love is pure, and love is holy, as well as kind and merciful. Seal thy word in our hearts, O Lord. With the seal of the living God, seal it in our minds. As you said you would do before, you would allow the winds of heaven to touch any tree or any green thing. Put upon our foreheads the mark of Christ. Take away from our hearts and minds the foolish notion the foolish notion that 666 is a number to be feared. Right upon our minds, your beautiful number, the beautiful mind of Jesus, which men can't see, and they will care less about the numbers 666, which men can't see either. But they will pray for them that God might bring them into the light. Even as thou art in the light. Now may the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good thing to do his will. Keep you unto the day of Christ. Prepare your hearts for this great day that lies before us as you talk often to him and less about the cares of this life. Stay in communion with him, not only telling him what you want, but having an inquiring heart to know what he wants. That as for us and our families, we will be found serving the Lord. Loving them, forgiving, gentle, forbearing, long-suffering, yet by your Spirit being able to minister righteousness to them and obedience and truth. That our children might grow up, Lord, in obedience and righteousness before thee. And that we, as we committed them to you when they were born, we might realize they are not really ours, except for a few brief years. They're really yours. That when we must take our hands off them completely, we need not fear because they were yours from the time they were born. Maybe we failed in many ways to impart to them the way we should have, the words of truth. But you know our hearts, Lord, you know our desires, though we made many mistakes. So now they're yours, Lord, and only you can deal with them now. Bring them in, Lord. Bring in our families. Bring in our families, Lord. Restore the family of God. Restore our homes, Lord. Take away the curse of divorce from your people. Amen. And if there are those in this gathering contemplating it, take away that curse that rests upon them. It's not to be considered. God has joined you. Let not man put asunder. Remove that curse that's in the land and in the church. I don't have the right mate, so I'll go find another. Remove that curse, Lord, from the minds of your people.
I pray in Jesus' name for this people, Lord, that there might be a purifying, sanctifying word that will linger with them, causing them, Lord, to draw near to you and to walk with you. Lord, bless you, everyone. I have really been encouraged here because, you know, you, we're, we all know we're living in a dry and thirsty land wherever you're at. Maybe some have a little more water in some places than others. But you begin to wonder, Lord, when, when are you going to move? Or, and the hearts, mine included, it seems to get so at times hard and calloused and dry. This little song is very short. The Lord, uh, I think, would have me do it with you here. You can, it's very short and you follow along, but it's very encouraging. It says, it goes like this. Mm-hmm.